to all of a sudden crave blood and not food or, you know, I mean. When, when Macon was talking to Thomas, she was describing to him this thing that happened to him, but also describing the other blood drinkers, the other people who drank blood. And she told him in the story, and I'm reflecting her words here, but she said people have drunk blood even from ancient times. And all the different reasons that she listed to him why people drank blood. Now, in the storyline, I distinguish between people who have to drink it like they are, vampiric, and people who just choose to drink it because they're all whacked out in the mind or they like hurting people. Uh, her advice to Thomas in that case was that if you're one of these second ones, you don't need to be hanging around those. And sadly enough in the story, um, there was a blood cult itself. And these were just human people that decided drinking blood would extend your life, and they were ruthless. So uh, Wright introduces you to human blood drinkers, and they're just as bad as... Uh, uh, anything you would ever want to meet? Yeah, I, I sure wouldn't want to meet you know meet anybody that does it. I mean, you know, I'd be, I'd want to stay you know on the other side of the street if I saw one. You know, I, uh, I don't know. In, in your book, I mean, does he able to function normally, or is, is he gone to the point like what my guess was, where he could not leave the room, and you know, and and the craving is so bad. That uh, Thomas had had the same light sensitivity, although to him it felt like the sun was boring into his brain through his skin and his blood was on fire. That's how it felt to Thomas. Um, vampiric people uh, are largely like human. For example, if you took a vampiric person's blood and looked at it under a microscope or tested it, it looks human. You, there's no, um, I don't want to say there's no thing to say that it's different than a human, but in the in the third story that I've not yet put out there yet, there's something that explains why they're so sensitive to light, and I call it phototoxins. It's it's what gives them that yuck feeling when they're in sunlight. And because Thomas changed from Macon, he has now uh, inherited her sensitivity to sunlight. And in the second story, it's very hyper-intense for him because his body is very reactive. And she told him he'd always have to be careful to avoid exposure to radiant energy like sunlight to avoid being sick. Now, it sounds like the, the gentleman that you're describing, for me, sort of breaks out in a rash. Well, he, but, said, he, uh, he, he, you know, he actually said it was a burning rash where, you know, that he would go outside and he would, you know, get a rash and it would start peeling. Very, uh, and it was very, very unpleasant. Very painful, yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't blame him for staying in, not really. I'm just wondering if if he's anemic from drinking all the blood, and that's when he goes outside. That's why you know he's pale, and uh, the sunlight affects him so much. I don't know. If, you know, I really haven't done that much research on it, other than you know, like I said, when I had him on my show, I afterwards I kind of had a hard time sleeping that night because some of the stuff he was talking about, it kind of really scared me. You know, because you know we're. It, it doesn't sound like he's gone through the change. Change. That, see, I describe in the story, it's sort of like a point of no return for them. Um, when May, In the third story, Macon is in an accident at the end of rights, and she's eventually um, taken hostage by these four doctors that are studying her, and one of them is her internist doctor. Uh, he's a very good man, but, you know, these other doctors have convinced him to sort of take her captive. And eventually he's going to put a tube down her throat to see why nothing can go down her throat, you know, except blood. And he's eventually going to force that tube down there to see what's there, and what's there is not a human stomach. Now I'm going to sort of 
uh, beg off the details uh, of what's there. But when I describe in the story, you know, that so-and-so's body began absorbing the blood immediately, when we digest things, you know, we drink, uh, you know, we eat and drink all different kinds of things, and it goes through our digestive system. Uh, in Thomas's case, uh, and less so in Macon and Stephen's case, their digestive system changes. And from what you're telling me at this point, it just sounds like the gentleman that you spoke to is still probably largely human blood drinker. Yeah. Uh, because it doesn't sound like that he's gone completely through the change, but he's definitely hooked on blood, you know, for either psychological and physiological. It is possible for a human to be physiologically and psychologically addicted to blood as well. Well, probably the same, um, same as alcoholism or, you know, popping pills or, you know, uh, other stuff. But, I mean, you know, I just, I don't know. It just, it kind of, you know, makes me wonder, you know, how many how many people are out there like this. I, I know that there evidently must be groups from what he was saying because he had a group of people that came over on a daily basis to feed him. And... Uh, it, it tells me that he, you know, there must be a little cults of this stuff going on. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, the vampiric people that I write about are fairly well isolated because they're lonely. I mean, they know each other, but they don't sort of mingle uh, except to find donors like what you're talking about. And so he's to be commended for, for, for seeking donors rather than just killing his way. Yeah, uh, because you, because you have to stay in front of your blood needs. You can't let them drive you. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah, I, that that's the part that um, what you're saying is basically they they have to be in front and make sure that they are covered. You know, with what they have a supply of blood, and you know, what, I kind of get the impression is if they don't have the supply of blood then it's a very good chance they might go seek it one way or the other. Oh, they will find it. Their bodies will force them to go get it, you know, willingly or not. And, you know, you if you're under duress and hunting for blood at the same time, that's just not a good combination. It's, it's, a, it's a recipe for somebody to get hurt, and we don't want that. They don't want that either because... See, to explain this from their point of view, the person that they drink blood from today, if they kill them, they won't be around, you know, a couple of weeks or a month down the road to drink blood from again. The human population is their food source. As gross as that is to, to say it that way, that's, that's really reassuring because they're not out to kill every human they see. They can't. They have to maintain their uh, their supply food source. Yes. So, what's the difference between your vampire and your book than actually the other vampire? Other than your vampire and the one that I talked to don't turn into you know a, um, a bat. You know, I mean, you know. The, well, uh, back in the early days, you know, uh, in in the package of material that. Uh, Nicole sends out for my interviews. Uh, I don't know that if, whether you've gotten that yet, but if you could get that, and I go into some of my background and some of the lucid dreams that I had when I was younger, and it was pretty bad. Um, just telling you, it was bad. But in any case, I started thinking about them and praying for them for a pretty, at a pretty young age. And my first exposure to vampire anything, so far as I could really remember, uh, you remember the gothic soap opera Dark Shadows? Oh, yeah. I used to come and, home from school and watch that. Oh, well, sure I did. Yeah, I did, uh, too. But, you know, I first, I first saw it, uh, you know, I was born in Chicago, family moved to Alabama, so about the time I was 13 or so, and I saw it um, 
actually at my father's sister's house because I got home from school in time to see it. But, I, you know, I didn't have the reaction, I guess, that everybody else had because the characterization of the vampire in that story, Barnabas Collins, touched my heart uh, because he was lonely and alone. And so from thinking about them from that age forward, I started disassembling these occultic elements uh, that you commonly see, like uh, no reflection in a mirror. I said, okay, uh, you've got a physical body. You have a mass. Uh, you are a person. Um, therefore, you have a reflection. And by the time I got through with those years of thinking that way about them, uh, what I was left with, you're, a vampiric person is a person who has to drink blood to live. And then all the other occultic things are not really um, what I focus on. I just focus on a person that's stuck in this condition, and it's uh, all the misery that goes with that. Well, I, I think, you know, like I said, talking to my guest, I, I mean, he, he when you can hear the misery. He was horrible. I mean, you know, he, he his life from what he was describing, really, really, I wouldn't want to go through it. I mean, it, he had no life, none. Well, like I say, they think of, I had to drink blood yesterday. I have to drink blood today. I have to drink blood tomorrow. Where do I get it? And that's all they think about 24-7. Whatever happens if they have a medical condition and they're in the hospital, I mean, you know, you, you can't sell t say to the nurse, hey, I need blood, you know. I mean, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, nurse uh, sort of sort of picks me up here. Yeah. Uh, nur there's, there's probably more, oh, God, I don't want to make people afraid. Well, no, go it ahead. Would be I mean, easy for the, it, it would be easy. It would be easy for a vampiric person to sort of slip in between, you know, like the hospital setting and uh, the phlebotomist to draw blood. In that kind of setting where, where drawing blood is accepted. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, so the next time you call this person a vampire that's coming to draw your blood, well, who knows? Uh, but like I say, they need it. And like I say, I'm for anything that keeps them from having to get it an alternative way that's not quite so pleasant. Well, I'd, be, I'd sure hate to be a young lady walking, or a man, for example, because he told me it didn't make no difference it was a man or a woman donating the blood. Uh, you know, it's just, I, you know, I hate to be walking down the street sometime at late at night and all of a sudden have somebody... You know, uh, cutting me or or worse to get my you know my blood, you know, and, and that's what scares me because like you know in your book or the the uh, the person I talked to, undoubtedly there's people that have totally changed into the point where maybe they're not even mentally stable anymore that they have the cravings of, of blood so bad, and maybe at some point they really do believe that they're an actual actual vampire. That's what scares me. Well. Well, you when you're when when you're talking to this guy and the others that you know that you're still thinking human point of view. I describe them as not quite human anymore. So there's a there's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, Macon is pretty well balanced as a person, you know. Uh, the reason I like her so much is because, you know, she's she was 294 years old when she met Thomas, and now she's about 319 or so. But I'm thinking that she survived for so long because most of her decisions, I'm not saying that she's perfect, but I'm thinking that she survived for so long and as well as she did because most of her decisions – and the way that she's lived her life had to be the right choices. You can be a big, bad, mean so-and-so person, or you could be a big, bad, mean so-and-so vampiric person, but eventually you're going to get yours. You know, like that cycle of seed time and harvest, what goes around comes around. Oh, yeah. So if you're, 
you're a big, bad, mean person, whether you're human or vampiric, uh, you're going to probably die soon. Because, uh, 